The drinking song of Earth's sorrow and the lonely one in autumn are the subject of this video, beginning our analysis of one of the greatest masterpieces of classical music, Gustav Mahler's Das Lied von der Erde. Hi, I'm Gian Maragrillo, I'm a conductor and a composer, and welcome to this episode of Conducting Builds, a series where we help you discover and dive deeper into a classical piece or a part of it, taking a look at its structure and phrasing, and sometimes its text. I want to take a second to thank my new patrons Jen Winley and Abby Caspi and to remind you that on my Patreon page you can find full episodes of Conducting Pills and the extra one tackling the technical aspects on top of live sessions and many other patron perks. Now, let's begin! <laughs> Leonard Bernstein described Das Lied von der Erde as Mahler's greatest symphony. And as a symphony was in fact published, a symphony for alto or baritone, tenor and orchestra. Written between 1908 and 1909, Das Lied is a succession of six songs for two singers alternating movements. Now, in order to even get a glimpse into this monumental work, we need to understand the biographical background that nurtured it. Mahler had been obsessed with death for a long time, but in the last years of his life it acquired a whole new meaning. In 1907 particularly, Mahler lost his daughter, Maria, to a scarlet fever, and soon after her death, Mahler himself was diagnosed with a congenital heart malfunction that would prohibit any activities that would exhaust his heart. If that wasn't enough, a long lasting anti-Semitic campaign against his role as a director of the then Vienna Hofhofer had gotten the best of him, resulting in his resignation. As he wrote to Bruno Walter, with one stroke I have lost everything I have gained in terms of who I thought I was, and have to learn my first steps again, like a newborn. In his quest for answers, or simply solace, Mahler was captivated by something extraneous, Hans Bethke's Die Chinesische Flöte, a paraphrase of an anthology of Chinese poetry published first in German translation by Hans Heilmann in 1905. Each movement of Das Lied von der Erde sets one poem with the exception of the last movement, which combines two of them. Mahler chose seven poems reflecting in Chinese philosophy the concept of transcendence, a way of going beyond the ordinary, valuing the spiritual aspects of life over the material ones. This concept ties organically with the appreciation and identification with nature, a theme that had always been so dear to Mahler. Mahler was looking for answers and he explored the combination of the nature object, something touchable and down to earth, with a philosophical one, something more intellectual without venturing into religion, in a unique spiritual synthesis. The tone of the symphony is set right from the opening piece titled The Drinking Song of Earth's Sorrow. It's a rather pessimistic reflection upon life, summarized in the verse Dunkel ist das Leben, ist der Tod. Dark is life, and so is death. Mahler opens the work with a dramatic gesture, a 16 bars introduction in A minor. This theme, played here by four horns, will reappear times and again throughout the movement. is coming, but the speaker urges the audience to wait until he's sung them his song. Mahler moves swiftly from A minor to B flat major, back to A minor, then A major, A minor, B flat major and G minor. Now, this constant harmonic fluidity makes it quite difficult to identify different sections based on the harmonic analysis. The thematic material, however, is of great help in this. This introduction by the speaker, outlined in the first stanza of the poem, holds all the pessimism we would expect. Dark is life, and so is death. We are abruptly taken back to the tempo prima and to the horn's call introducing the second stanza. The orchestration is different from the opening, though closer to rehearsal number four. The flutes are up an octave, sounding more shrill, and the clarinet in E flat enhances this particular sound with its trills. The first trumpet takes over the horns. <laughs> The wine idea is back in the words of the speaker. 
master of this house, your cellar holds its fill of golden wine. Structurally, we can see many similarities with the first stanza. The same thematic material, the same rough key changes, the tempo markings. It's not a carbon copy though, and the refrain ends up being in A flat minor, half step higher than the previous time. After which, there is no reprise of the opening material. Mahler gives us a sort of interlude before the next stanza using different parts of the previous musical material, like this. Or this. The entrance of the singer here is in a piano dynamic. For the first time, the theme of nature is introduced. The positive images of the firmament and the blossoming spring seem to overpower the pessimism we've seen so far. Until, of course, reality strikes. But thou, O oh man, for how long do you live? The original text ended this stanza with the usual refrain, but Mahler cut it out. This makes the text more concise and keeps up the level of the drama, leading us directly into the last stanza. The agony increases. Not only humans cannot measure up with the universe in terms of time at their disposal, but they are also doomed to loneliness, as the ape crying to the moon represents. The tension keeps growing, reaching the climax of the movement. Notice the desperation of the words, encouraging the audience to soothe their loneliness with wine. It is an ape, hear him howling and yelling and shattering the sweet fragrance of life. Now take the wine, now it is time, companions. What's left after that is the refrain, again half step higher. And after a short coda, the movement ends with a shattering A minor chord in the lowest register of the orchestra. This piece is particularly demanding for the tenor, fighting a constant battle with the orchestra and singing most of the time in the mid-height register. The choice is intentional, the height as it were is meant to make it easier, so to speak, for a shrill sound to come through, perfectly apt to a drinking song with its sour notes. From the roller coaster of the first movement, we land in a totally different atmosphere. Look at the descriptiveness of the tempo indication. Somewhat dragging, exhausted. The lonely one in autumn is a lament for the dying of the flowers and the passing of beauty. It's a return to the theme of nature combined with the theme of time. The movement starts and ends in D minor without modulating to far keys like the first movement. Everything contributes to a sense of calmness. Again, we have four stanzas, each one connected to the other by an interlude. The opening couldn't be more lonely. Only the first violins with mutes are playing a wavy but still repeating figure of eight notes. Two bars later, a solo oboe comes in. The theme played by the oboe seems to fold upon itself, trying to figure out its own direction. The texture grows almost imperceptibly. Two horns and the second violins first join in in thirds with the first. And then a clarinet echoes the oboe. One by one, the other instruments are added to the mix. A second clarinet, the bass clarinet, the violas, cellos, and the flute. But the sound remains clear without the sensation of a crescendo built by the overlapping of the instruments. And as a matter of fact, some come in, some leave, in a sort of chamber music game. All of this prepares the entrance of the alto, or bird. Herzlich. 
it's the autumn mists drifting over the lake with the downward movement. It is the world observed from the outside. The orchestration hints towards an almost cold and careless mood, but the movements of the singer's line betray a deeper emotion. At the flissant, the singer rests, giving the line to the horns and cellos. A few bars and the speaker is back to complete the first stanza. An element of importance which we find throughout the whole movement is the cello line at tempo primo. This rocking figure with duplets nested into triplets is mesmerizing, rendering the almost hypnotic state of the speaker in contemplation of the world. The speaker's line moves again downward and upward, followed by a short interlude connecting to the second stanza. The formula is repeated, but there seems to be an increase in tension. It's just a moment. Look at the triplets of the strings. They intended to raise the temperature, but they are forced back down, turning into the rocking movement. At rehearsal number 11, Muller lets us look inside his own self. Mein Herz is müde. My heart is tired. Three heartbeats followed by two longer ones. And yet, look at what he writes on top of that line. Ohne Ausdruck, without expression. Mein Herz ist müde. Followed by an attempt to fight it. The scale of the violence ends on a reverse motive, which will determine the very end of the symphony. We'll see a lot more of this motive on the way. In the last movement is sung on the word Ewig, forever. The flute dampens that thought right away. The rocking motive returns, and right after, the speaker is ready to continue, yearning for some rest and consolation. And just like that, we circle back to the beginning. The fourth stanza makes use of the same material with a different orchestration. The bassoon adds an even sadder note, sounding remote and untouchable. Autumn in my heart is lasting too long. We expect everything to die away, but unexpectedly we get to a fortissimo which retreats within a bar, and then the music grows, drawing energy through three words in the following verse. Sun, love, shine, sun of love, will you never shine again? It builds and builds, and for a few bars we have some sort of hope. The hope is slowly crushed as we realize that there is no hope. We are taken back to the opening material. We are doomed to observe the inevitability of time consuming everything and everyone. Look at the last notes of the violence. It's the Avic motive. Thank you for watching, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button right below the video and ring the bell so you will be notified every time a new video comes out. If you want to support the show monetarily, you can do so on my Patreon page. And if you're interested in conducting technique, follow my Facebook group. All the links are in the description. Let me know in the comments what you think about this piece and if you have any suggestions for future videos. And I look forward to seeing you next week with a new episode of Conducting Pills when we will go on to the second part of Mahler's Das Lied von der Ebbe. In the meanwhile, please continue to enjoy music and be well. Ciao! Musical topos, happening particularly often at the end of a rising phrase. The most effective way to tackle this kind of musical surprise is to not drop your arm down on the piano downbeat, but to remain up.